<laughs> Raise your hand if you think the world is a strange place right now. <laughs> okay, meanwhile, back at the ranch. In the end of Acts 24, a couple of weeks, or last week, it says after two years had passed, Paul was in jail there, basically in Caesarea for two years. Felix, the cat, was succeeded by Porcius Festus. Festus. And wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. My question, what, what is it? Why would Felix, a Roman governor, want to do the Jews a favor? Yeah, what, what is that about? What is this favor? What, what, how, do you, how do you do the Jews a favor by keeping Paul in prison? He was a Gentile, wasn't he? He was a Gentile. Yeah, so he needed, he needed to curry some favor with them and do something. that He wouldn't kill him. He wouldn't kill Paul. But he just, it, I think that that's the answer, is he is trying to keep the Jews happy without actually doing what they want him to do. We call that passing the buck, right? Yes. Who was the U.S. president that had a plaque on his desk that said, the buck stops here? Truman. How many of us were born in the Truman administration? Yeah, that's right. Four. <laughs> was Lincoln president, Janine? <laughs> okay. If, if uh, Festus' first name is Porcius, what do you think his nickname was? Porcius. Pork. Who would name their person Pork? <laughs> okay. So let's hear 25, verse 1. We're going to read this way to that way. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. That's it. And when you're going toward Jerusalem, what direction are you going? Up. Doesn't matter if you're going north, south, east, or west. If you're going away from Jerusalem, a man went down the Jericho Road, right? It's kind of like if you move from Nebraska to Colorado, you're going up. If you move from Colorado to Oklahoma, you're going down, spiritually, physically, geographically. Can any good thing come out of Oklahoma? Okay, that's a good thing. Okay, let's hear two to five. Next verses. And the chief priests and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul, and they were urging him, requesting a confession against Paul, that he might have been brought to Jerusalem at the same time, sending an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus then answered that Paul was being kept in custody at Caesarea, and that he himself was about to be put in. Therefore, he said, let the influential men among you go there with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them persecute him. Yeah, he's not stupid, is he? We're not going to put Paul on the road again. We already know you tried to kill him once. You want to deal with him? You come down here and play on my turf. Okay? So verse 6 and 7, what's their response? Eight or ten days later, he returned to Caesarea, and on the following day, Paul's trial began. On Paul's arrival in court, the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem gathered around and made many serious accusations they couldn't prove. And Paul makes a nice short speech, verse 8. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. In the history of all the prophets of Israel, no one's ever made a speech that short. <laughs> <laughs> well, boy, he sums it up, doesn't he? Okay, what is Festus going to say? This is the new guy. Fest Pardon? Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Wow. So he, just like Felix before him, wants to do the Jews a favor. Okay. So political corruption is not anything new, is it? Everybody's playing past the buck and be nice to people you don't like. All right, here we go. Verse 10 to 12. Here comes Paul's answer now. So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know. For I am a, an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one could deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You appeal to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. How many of your, your texts have exclamation points after, I appeal to Caesar, right? That's a translator's liberty because there's no such punctuation marks in Greek. But the context is, 
makes it sound like a very declarative sin. I appeal to Caesar. And apparently, a Roman citizen can do that, can say, I want to, I want to be up the line. And there's a line to get to Caesar. In fact, Paul never gets to Caesar, right? But by appealing to Caesar, he says, to Caesar you will go. Very interesting to me. But look who shows up next. Listen to 13. And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to, to salute Festus. Yeah, Agrippa, Agrippa, I don't know. Pick one. And I put a little box here, and I don't really want to read the whole thing to you, but there's this dynasty of Herodian, of descendants of Herod. If we know Herod the Great, he's the guy that kind of rebuilt the temple that, that Nehemiah and Ezra and them had, had raised from the ashes. He, he finishes it out. So that in Jesus' day, it's called Herod's Temple. But he's the, he's the guy who was the, the local governor, half Jew, half something else, uh, who was in charge when Jesus is born and the Magi come. Right? This is Herod the Great, right? He orders the death of all the two-year-old boys in that one village of Bethlehem. We're not talking thousands of boys, but we're talking dozens, I don't know, hundred. You know, this is Herod the Great, right? We know him. He had a, the first Herod was actually his father. But then Archelaus is mentioned in the Bible. He rules in Jerusalem. His brother, Philip, Luke mentions when Philip was the tetrarch, the prince over a fourth in Galilee. And then his son is Agrippa the First. He's the grandson of Herod the Great. He's the guy in Acts 12, you remember back? They thought, saying, he's a god, he's a god. Well, God said, I've had enough of this guy, right? And worms got him, and he died, right? At this time, he's, uh, Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. At this time, was Nero was Caesar? We're not sure. In, in the next line down under that box, I put, I think it's Claudius. I believe that Claudius or Claudius was still Caesar, but it could have been Nero because we we're pretty sure from historical writings that Nero ordered the death of Paul and Peter. Yeah, according to my, the Bible yeah. here, he's the, the, it, so Nero may already be in Nero. Nero. Could be, yeah. but he was in power for quite well, some you time. You think about how terrible Nero was to, to the oh. Jews after this. How yes. could Paul appeal to him? I yeah. Mean. Well, yeah, we'll come back to that. Okay. So uh, let's keep keep the story going here for a minute. So here comes. The guy whose name is King Marcus Julius Herod Agrippa II, right? He enters here in verse 13, and everybody's going to bow down to him. Now, he's coming probably from been in Rome, but he is now the king of this territory we call Israel, Palestine, whatever you call it. And it's not an independent country. It's a part of the Roman Empire. Okay, let's hear 14 to 21. This is kind of a long passage here. I'm going to take, I'm going to bring you the mic. Oh, okay. Can I stand up? And Just stand up and read loud. <laughs> Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there is a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked him that he be condemned. I told them that it is not the Roman custom to hand over any man before he has forced his accusers and has had an opportunity to defend himself against their charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but conveyed the court daily and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus, who Paul claimed was alive. I was at loss how to investigate such matters, so I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. When Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him help until I could send him to see him. Thank you. It's a phenomenal speech, and we have it word for word, probably because when it was in, in a court setting, there were people writing down as he spoke, weren't there? And they probably published that. Here's what Festus had to say today, right? And who got their hands on a copy of that? Luke. Our friend Luke probably got his hands on a... He might have been in the courtroom. If not, you know, Luke tells us in, in both Luke and Acts that he tended to research things, and he talked to eyewitnesses and people that were involved. And so I always said, oh, we're so rich because of Luke. that we get the word-for-word -word account of Festus Porcius Festus saying, I told this guy to go to Jerusalem and he appealed to Caesar, so I'm stuck. I can't send him to, 
Well, then I have to send him to Caesar, okay? So now we get to verse 22. Let's hear this speech. When Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself, he replied, Tomorrow you will hear him. <clears throat> the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. The command of Festus, Paul, was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa, and I and all who are present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea. Caesarea. Shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving of his death, but, I, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send a prisoner off to Rome without specifying the charges against him. Thank you, Governor Festus. You have nothing specific to write to Caesar, and you think it's unreasonable, or let's say politically unwise, <laughs> to send this guy without specifying the charges, lest I get in trouble, right? Going back to the last what we read, a certain man named Jesus had died. Yeah. I like the way that it's phrased. Yes. Had died. Fascinating. And there are a number of secular accounts not in the Bible about that. Um, gosh, I remember who they were. Josephus, writing in the a, a book that's in the museum, so you can get English copies of it, wrote The Lives of the Twelve Caesars. And at one point he talks about there arose a crazy rabbi from the north of Israel named Jesus of Nazareth. And he went about teaching and astounding the people, drawing great crowds and did miracles. And the uh, Jews captured him and got permission from the Romans, and the Romans crucified him, and he died. But his followers say he lived. You turn the page. And he just goes on with a story <laughs> as if to say, I don't know either. Right. It just ends. So it then, like yeah. Yeah, it's not the joke. And then Pliny the Younger writes um, a little later about the followers of Jesus are the best citizens I have. He writes to Caesar. Probably Nero. And, and Pliny's letter says they're the best citizens around. They care for their own poor. They care for the other poor. They take care of their people. They teach love and peace and everything. But they will not sacrifice uh, the annual offering and take the pinch of, of incense and throw it on the fire and say that Caesar is Lord. They refuse to do that. Uh, and what do I do? And the emperor wrote back and said, give them a second chance. And if they won't do it, kill them. We don't know if Pliny actually did or not, but that's a, one of those extra biblical document historical sources of all this stuff actually happened. And you either you either, un, you either receive it or you reject it or you just are confused by it. And th this is going to get better. Watch this. So that's part one, right? So Agrippa and Festus have a plan, and Festus has a situation. Right? Now we turn the page to part two. Go to the back of the handout. Here comes Paul's speech. Now I'm going to read it to you with the microphone primarily, but I like this speech. This is Paul's fifth speech that we found in the book of Acts. It's the last one he ever makes in the book of Acts. It's his longest one, it's his best one, and it's his best impersonation of Billy Graham, okay? <laughs> Can I put it that way? So Agrippa said to Paul in verse one, you have permission to speak for yourself. Never tell a preacher that he has permission. To speak. <laughs> so Paul motioned with his hand for everyone to be quiet, begin his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. So he kind of butters up the grip a little bit. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jews all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child. From the beginning of my life in my own country, which would be Turkey, Asia Minor, Tarsus, also in Jerusalem, They've known me for a long time. They can testify, if they're willing, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, which would be which one? The Pharisees. I lived as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers. I'm the guy that says hope, H-O-P-E, means holding on to promises expectantly. We're living. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Hold on to that promise whether wars come or 
political corruption or economic disasters or whatever it befalls us. Hope. It's not hope is not. I hope the Broncos win. That's wishful thinking. <laughs> but, but a hope that's based on a promise of God is what we hold on to. Okay. So Paul's he's doing a good job here. I'm sorry to commentate, but I can't help myself. This is um, because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. This is the promise our twelve tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. O King. It's because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises from the dead? I too was convinced I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. When they, and, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. He even held the coats one time when they stoned Stephen. He left that out, didn't he? Many a time I went from one synagogue to another and have them punished. Y'all know synagogues are local congregations, right? There's one temple, infinite number of synagogues. I went from town to town. I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. On one of those journeys, I was on the road to Damascus, Nebraska, right up the road. Not that Fort Morgan, not that far away. You can walk from Denver to Fort Morgan. If you're patient, right? It'll take you what, three or four days? They did it. Or you'd ride a donkey or a camel. They didn't have Greyhound buses. Okay. I was only going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest about noon, O king. Why would he mention the time of day? To say I wasn't dreaming at night. About noon, I was on the road. I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. Jim commentary. Many of the people who have had near-death experiences talk about a light or a being of light, right? He sees this light brighter than the sun blazing around me. We all fell to the ground. Nobody else saw the light but him, right? But everybody's on the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic. Aramaic is the form of Hebrew spoken that day, right? Luke is writing in the Greek formal language, but they converse. And the voice said, Saul, Saul, you ever hear your own name and your thought voice? That may be the Holy Spirit talking to you. Yeah. Jim, Jim, knock it off. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and how's yeah. that working for you? Yes. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, I've said, as Charles Swindoll famously said, the voice of the Holy Spirit often sounds like the voice of your wife. <laughs> okay. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. The goads are the things that you put on the oxen harness to keep them from acting up. And if you kick against the goads, it hurts. Um, how many of you have, in some translations, this is in red letters. Is it, how many have a red letter? Uh, yeah, a bunch of us have that. Yeah. Because Paul is quoting what Jesus said. Now, you don't find very much red letter verses outside of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Remember the one in Acts 20, 20? It's better to, remember the Lord said, red letters, it's better to give it. They receive. We can't find that in Matthew, Luke, or John. But apparently Jesus said it, nobody wrote it down. So it's in Acts. And then here, this one is from Acts chapter 9, right? And I said, Who are you, Lord? <laughs> and I am Jesus. I love that I am, right? That's mm -hmm. Yahweh, Jehovah. I am that I am. I am the I am. I am Yeshua, Joshua. I am the Savior, whom you are persecuting. Now get up, stand on your feet. When people have angel encounters and fall down, what do the angels say? Don't be afraid. Stand up. Yep. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. The Greek word for witness is martyreo, like martyr. It doesn't always mean you die for your faith, but you, you tell what you've seen and heard and know is real. You're a witness. I've appointed you as a servant. I think it's a missionary, an apostle. Right? The one who goes, one who's sent by someone else. A witness of me. What you've seen and what I will show you. So God says, I'm going to show you. Right there in this conversation, Jesus said to Paul, I am going to show you more. And later, Paul says, I spent a couple of years out in the desert after this at the seminary of Jesus. And he said, I wasn't really, I didn't learn all this stuff by man. So he becomes the great interpreter of Jesus by virtue of the the Damascus Road experience, and then later he goes off in the desert by himself. And he's a Pharisee, so the whole Old Testament's practically in his head. 
I can see him sitting after thinking and realizing everything in the Old Testament is pointing toward Jesus. The whole New Testament story of Jesus is in the Old Testament in types and shadows. The new is in the old concealed. The old is in the new revealed, right? So he's even talking about that right here. Jesus told me he's going to show me the whole thing. Wow. So I am sending you, let's see, where am I? As a witness, 17, I will rescue you from your own people, the Jews, and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who have been sanctified by me. So this is writing, we're in Acts 26. He's relating the story from Acts 9. And he says, on that day on the Damascus road, God, Jesus said to me, I'm Jesus, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. And we just read missionary trip number one, missionary trip number two, missionary trip number three. I mean, we're seeing the, the prophecies that he's relating. God told me this was going to happen, and it happened. And how many times on those three trips did somebody try to kill Paul? Bunches. How many times did they succeed? Zero. <laughs> so now he's relating all this to people. And they know this. They are sitting in Caesarea, Maritima. They know that Paul has made these three journeys. They are hearing his whole story. I mean, they want to think, you know, this guy may be telling the truth. <laughs> so now we got Paul talking again. So then King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, then Judea, and to the Gentiles also. It's almost paraphrasing Acts 1.8. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, the county around Jerusalem, to the Gentiles in the north, and then everywhere else. I preach that they should repent. Repent. What does repent mean? Change your mind. Turn around. Go the other way. That's right. If you're driving up 35th Avenue, something you go past, you end up at 20th Street, you repent. You make a U-turn and come back. Right? They should repent and, and repent. What are they what are you actually repenting of? I think we're repenting of unbelief ultimately. We repent of unbelief in Jesus. And it's like two sides of a coin, maybe. The repentance is the tail side, and you, you flip it over, and you put your faith in the Jesus. His face is on the head side. Okay. Does that help? That is interesting. There are actually two words for repent in the Greek language. One is metamelami, I change the way I think, and metanoia, I change my mind. They're both uh, not active verbs, but they're reflexive verbs. There's some, I do this to myself. So I repent. I choose my will. We say you, you, you surrender to God. You accept Jesus. You receive the gospel. Any of those terms, it's all about that repenting of not trusting God for your salvation and putting your trust in God for salvation. So he said, I did it. And I preached everywhere I went. Repent. 21. This is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help this very day. Yes, he has. So I stand here to testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. That the Christ would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would proclaim life to his own people and the Gentiles. And at this point, verse 24, Festus says, Suddenly Festus shouted, Paul, oh, you are insane. Too much study has made you crazy. Wow, Elaine, just tell it like it is. You've lost your mind. You know, it's wild, isn't it? When people hear the gospel of Jesus, they tend to respond one of three ways. They receive it, they reject it, or they just say, I don't care. It's They're apathetic. I don't care. In this case, he's rejecting it. You ever heard that thing that the claim Jesus, the claims of Jesus are that he was God in the flesh, incarnated from the deity, the creator of everything, and came to be a sacrifice. I think it was C.S. Lewis that was the one who maybe coined this phrase. Either you think he's a lunatic who thinks he's God, but he's not. We've had some lunatics who thought they were God, right? And they weren't. Or he's a liar. He knows he's not God, but he's lying, or he's Lord. Logically, there's not a lot of other explanations other than I don't care. And I've had people tell me I don't care, which they, they which means they just can't deal with it. They can't. You, know, you and I, though, it's either lunatic. I don't. How many believe he's a lunatic? No. Nope. Liar? No. Nope. That leads us to Lord, right? Uh, 
you either receive it, you reject it, or you just shrug and walk away. But th the response of this guy, Festus, you've gone insane. But watch, Paul continues. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus governor. What I am saying is true and reasonable. Y'all believe that? Amen. The king is familiar. King Agrippa is familiar with these things. He's half Jewish. I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in the corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. And Agrippa says, Do you think that on such short time you can what? <laughs> I think it, in the original Greek it almost says, almost thou has persuaded me to be a Christian. This is only the second time in the New Testament you see the word Christian. You remember the first in Antioch, the followers of Jesus were called little Christ, Christian. This is the second time. And who's using it? Who said that? King Agrippa II uses the word Christian in the context of you've almost persuaded. Is he being, I don't think he's being sarcastic. I think he's almost like feeling cornered. You know, I've, had, I've been witnessing the people who felt like they were being cornered. <laughs> Push them too hard. Almost. This, is this the saddest, in a way, what if he had said, Okay, I believe you. He says, Agrippa, don't you believe the prophets? And Agrippa said, do you think in a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? I, I don't think he's challenging. I think he's almost in panic. You're about to make a Christian out of me. Paul says, 20 years, I'm Paul again. Short time or long time, I pray God that not only you, but all who are in the room today may become like I am follower of Jesus, except for these chains I'm wearing. In the background, I hear music. I hear just as I am. Yes. Just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me. In the name of God I come. I How many of you were ever in a Billy Graham meeting. Yeah. Some of us viewers, yeah. oh my gosh, they've seen that thing how many times? 17 verses. Yeah. But you'd be up there watching people come down those aisles. It was pretty yeah. phenomenal. And of course, the first battalion coming down the aisles were the counselors, because they're trained. On the first note of the song, you start walking down. Because psychologically, the person who really needs to come, if he sees others coming, will be more inclined to come. But I, I was privileged to be at one in Lubbock, Texas. The only time Billy Graham ever came to Lubbock, he packed out Jones Stadium seven nights in a row, filled with 50,000 people. They drove for hundreds of miles. They brought people who were not believers, uh, wonderful music and all that kind of stuff, and Graham preached. And I was on the committee that I got drafted to be on the committee. They couldn't find anybody else, literally, they drafted me, that shuffled decision cards in the middle of the night. And we went to First Baptist Church, there were about 25 people. And there were hundreds every night of these cards that were filled out. And they had to type them up, because they were handwritten, they typed them up in triplicate. One copy went to the Grand Association, and one copy went to the local committee. The other copies were sorted by zip code and placed in envelopes to be delivered to the churches that were the nearest to that, or in that zip code. And I was one of the drivers on my way home. I would stop at two or three churches at midnight and take envelopes to the front door of the church. They had the Billy Graham Association, report to the churches on it had duct tape, a big tape, because the churches were all locked up at midnight. And, and inside it said, here are the people who came to Christ or made a rededication who live in your zip code. Please follow up with them. Right. So the Graham Association tried really hard to do that, but it was, uh, this is, here is Paul. Yes. Yeah. Abilene, Kansas, where I raised the girls, they actually, he came to Abilene, Kansas, because that's the home of Eisenhower. And he did a big thing there, but it wasn't a crusade. But boy, he shared about Jesus even yeah. at, the, at the time of his death. They said that Graham had preached to more people than anybody in face to face, not counting the, the mediums. Although there's a German evangelist named Reinhard Bonnke. Y'all ever heard of him? Oh, he was all over Africa and had huge crowds of, of 200,000 people at a whack. A rattlesnake in a 
I hate snakes. Me too. I've got my feet up, man. I received a Barbara Walters interview with Billy Graham. No, the Barbara Walters interview with Billy Graham. The introduction, she said, I've been trying for weeks to dig up dirt on this guy. And she said, there's not any. He is, you know, he's the real deal. But Oprah Winfrey once had him on her show, too. And Oprah's kind of all over the map, you know. And uh, she loves, uh, what's his name, the Indian guy. Uh, can't think of his name. Deepak, Deepak Chopra. Yeah. He's on PBS sometimes. I, I cannot figure out Deepak. But uh, when she had, and Oprah grew up in church, you, you know that her, she was named, we were talking about Ruth this morning. Ruth's sister was named Orpa. And Oprah Winfrey, I heard her say on television, my mother was trying to name me for the for the sister of Ruth, and she just misspelled it on the birth certificate. Yeah. That's how I got the name yeah. Oprah. I heard that too. Uh, and her company is called Harpo Productions because it's it's Oprah backwards. Uh, Harpo. Uh, but anyway, the, on the, I remember uh, reading this and saw it on something. That when she had Billy Graham on, she led the TV audience in singing, just as I am. I mean, this is Oprah. So. I thought that was kind of cool. Because he had Billy. Okay, so who has been doing the preaching for Billy Graham since he died? You know? Franklin and his son, Will. And uh, Franklin Graham still is the figurehead leader of the Graham Association, which is still pretty big. They do a lot of stuff around the world that we don't even hear about. But Will is really running it. And Franklin runs the disaster relief agency called Samaritan's Purse, which is the largest relief Christian relief agency on the planet by a huge factor. Would you like to know how much money they raised last year? Yeah. Will Graham told my friend Carlos and told me that they crossed the one billion mark. That's a thousand million. But every time there's a disaster anywhere, Samaritan's Purse is there the next year. Yeah, oh gosh, yeah. They're everywhere. They own a couple of freighter jets and they own some ships that go slower, but they're they're a wonderful ministry, a wonderful <coughs> outreach, and that's mostly Franklin's time now is kind of with that. So anyway, back to Paul. So Paul is doing the Billy Graham thing here, right? <laughs> Let me tell you, if there was ever an evangelistic sermon preached, this is it. He starts out saying, you know, I appreciate you guys. Thank you. I honor you for being here. Let me tell you my personal testimony. I was this way, and Jesus encountered me, and now I'm this way. And let me tell you what Jesus is really all about. His message is... His, mandate is to share this word around the world. Go and preach. And I want all of you, he gives a gospel invitation there, right? So if you ever get a chance to, he might ask you what your story is, you do it in three points. Well, my life before I came to Christ was whatever. Now maybe you don't have a memory of not being in church, and that's your story. I grew up in a church family. I don't remember a time when Jesus was not part of my life, but if you can say this, then there came a day when I was realized I was living under my parents' faith and I had to step out and establish my own faith. You may not remember what that day was. It might have been in a camp. It might have been in church. It might have been through some personal trial. Some disaster happened to you as a teenager or a young adult. And then you said, I'm going to be a follower. You, you had that awakening. Uh, the Wesley brothers had it at Aldersgate. Aldersgate? Yeah, John and Charles Wesley. They called it that, what do you call it, that strange warmth or whatever that it was. The Baptists called it being born again. Pentecostals call it getting full of the Holy Ghost. Whatever you call it, I don't care. I believe in the first blessing and the second blessing and the third blessing, too, if you can get one. <laughs> but you would tell your testimony, my life before Christ, and it may be that I don't remember much about it, but I've always grew up in church. More like me, you can say, I went 24 years just not paying attention to God, thinking God was busy. And then one day, God hit me with a two-by-four and turned around, blah, 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 okay? Then the third point is my life now. And I think the end of your testimony is more important than how you got here. And the important thing to share is, I know that my sins are forgiven, my past is forgiven, as I would like to say it, my past is forgiven, my present life has more meaning and purpose than ever before, and my future is secure. And if you share, no one can argue with your testimony, right? They can say you've lost your mind, <laughs> but they can't really say, you know, they can say, I don't want that. But it's a, it's a gentle way to share your faith but without preaching to people. You simply tell, this is what happened to me. And you can say, has anything like this ever happened to you? Do you feel that your sins are forgiven? Is your future secure? What will happen to you if your bus hits you today? You can ask those questions and find out where they are. 
And the believers will be pretty quick to tell you they've got some faith. And other people will say, well, I hope it works out okay. And that's not a good time to be using the word hope. Yeah, we, we have hope. We're holding on to promises. But to just hope things work out, it's like hoping the Broncos win. Do they even play today? I don't even know. Two thirty. Two thirty. Okay. <laughs> Lord, help the Broncos. I need it. Okay. Um, let's finish the story. Let's hear thirty to thirty-two. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, "This man doeth nothing worthy of death." Or of bonds. Then said Agrippa to the Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Wow, he might have been set free, except he created this appeal thing to Caesar. We have, we have no choice but to send him to Rome. But what did Paul really want anyway? Did he want freedom? What did he want to do? You want to go to Rome? Right. I mean, they played right into his hands, didn't they? If you don't believe that, I put a hint. In Romans chapter 1, in verse 10 to 15, he says, I'm longing to come to Rome and preach to you, the believers in Rome, everything I've been telling everybody else. And so, since I haven't gotten to come to you, this book of Romans is the big picture. It has eight great doctrines of the faith. We're all sinners. We're only justified by faith. Jesus, God demonstrates his love for us while we're yet sinners. The wages of death is hell, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ. There's now no condemnation in Christ. There's the security of the believer, right? And if you want this, here's how you get it. So the book of Romans really is his advance letter to Rome, right? Saying, I wish I could come preach to you. I'm trying to get there. But here's what I'm telling everybody else. And all the other books are more detailed, aren't they? Corinthians and Ephesians and Philippians. But the big, big picture book is Romans. Where else, did anybody tell me, Paul also said he wanted to go somewhere else. He said, I really want to go to where? Spain. Oh, I hear it. Spain. Y'all know. And Spain's a long way on the other side of Rome. As far as we know, he never, he never left Rome. But the gospel got to Spain, didn't he? He didn't get to the gospel. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. Then we're going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Take a couple minutes and let's talk around the tables. These three questions. What does all this persecution and trial mean to us today? Why are we studying this story? Or what do you think? And if we're not apostles, how exactly are we supposed to respond to being persecuted and harassed? Uh, Christians are being persecuted and harassed more and more in our own country. And our friends in China say, bring it on. You're going to love it. It's going to strengthen the churches. <laughs> Thank you, friends in China. Uh, why do you think God allows his people to, some people undergo awful, awful things. Why, why does God allow all the things? Okay, start now. Yes, sir. I'd like to apologize for that break. Uh, it was uh, Paul riding the train to Fort Morgan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Work on the question. I'm going to close in a minute. <laughs> share for those of you that didn't get an email from me about this movie that's being shown. Uh, it's going to be here in Greeley. It's through Angel Studios. 
which is the uh, studios where the Chosen came from. And it's all about um, um, near-death near -death experiences, thank you. And um, I don't have the, the contact list that Connie has, so hopefully you know, we'll be able to send it out. But when you get this, there's a little place to click, and it, it says, so here's this one, um, access the live stream. And when you go there, you will see a, a trailer for the movie. And then it, there's a place to buy tickets. And right now, there's a code that you can you buy one, get one free. And that code is life, the word life after. What's the name of it? The name of the movie is After Death. I I went on there and two people have already bought tickets, so you better buy them. What theaters are going to be at? It's really in this one, one in Fort Collins. We're not going to Fort Collins. We're going to. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll put we'll an email out and say, here's the date that we're going to be in. You can go anytime, but if you're free that night, it's kind of fun. We'll dominate the theater and be around. Right. <laughs> 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 that sounds like that. Last word. Barbara the Barbara. Is moving to Minnesota? No. Where? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Rochester. Oh, you in the Mayo Clinic. Okay, you in the Mayo Brothers. And when, when are you going to have to move? How soon? Uh, we'll, we'll pack up where I'll take. that those who bless Jerusalem are blessed by God and those who fight against it are not so blessed. So we'll pray. Father God, we do. As we close the morning, we pray again as both of our services and many others and across America and across the world, we're praying for peace. We're praying this thing cools down. Wiser heads prevail and people go home and release the captives. We are praying for the peace of Jerusalem, the peace of Israel, and for all the people who are suffering in this thing. Lift them up as intercessors and say, God, be there. Be strong. Show yourself. Give people that peace in the midst of war. Give them protection. Give them provision. And give them a way out of this thing. That you be honored and glorified by the end of wars. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.